This morning we're going to be looking at, at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 25, but I want to read all of Hebrews 10 so that we get a sense of the, of the context of the passage. So turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 10. I'm going to read this chapter. Hebrews 10, beginning in verse 1, For since the law has but a, a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise would they have uh, not have ceased to be offered, since the worshipers, having been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. The Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after, saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there's forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and who has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and was outraged the spirit of grace? But we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the former days when, after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised for yet in a little while. And when the coming, uh, and the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but those who have faith and preserve their souls. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you would uh, feed us today. Feed us from the, the word of God. Give us what we need, Lord. 
ears to hear, eyes to see, that we might rest in the finished work of Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Lately, especially even this past week, it seems that darkness is gaining ground. Ohio is a darker place than it was a week ago. When the results of the election came in, particularly issue one, um, there were many who rejoiced. They lifted up their voices, they lifted up their hearts to the God of this world. Let's call him Molech. And they effectively praised him that they were able to sacrifice their children at the altar of their own fornication, their own selfishness. But it's not just locally getting dark. Across the country and even the world, the spiritual forces of evil are fomenting the hatred of Antifa and its subsidiaries. They're fomenting the hatred to rally and riot against This time it's Israel and her allies. And why? Because Jesus himself said people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. We all understand that this is not the first time in history where it looks like the darkness is winning. In fact, history is is filled with ebbs and flows of good and evil. Nations and, and evil leaders have come and gone. Seasons of excess and and, and rampant immorality have been as predictable as the first snowfall of the year. And through it all, Christ has been building his church. In our day, there's a a Latin phrase from history, uh, the history of the church, that is helpful for us to keep in mind. Post tenebras lux. After darkness, light. That phrase was really the rallying cry of the Protestant Reformation. It was used to illustrate God's God's gracious revealing of the true gospel after what can only be described as centuries of gospel corruption rather than a gospel of works or a gospel that is only available uh, through the offices of a church, the Roman Catholic Church or the Eastern Orthodox Church. The Reformation made plain, once again, the gospel of grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. See, before the Reformation, before, say, 1517, a a typical churchgoer, this would be practically everyone in Europe, for example, a typical churchgoer would walk into church on the Lord's Day, They would hear the entire service spoken in Latin, a language almost everybody did not understand. They would be told that the only way to assure that their loved ones would escape from purgatory would be if they gave more money to the Vatican building program. They would have been regularly taught that the way of salvation was to keep the seven sacraments of the church. And even then, they would only be allowed into heaven once they had been completely purged of all sin and in this so-called purgatory, a place the the Bible says nothing of, a a place that, frankly, does not exist. The focal point of the Roman Catholic Church service was the Mass, the, the Catholic Church believed and still believes that the Mass is exactly the same sacrifice that Jesus Christ offered on the cross at Calvary. That the bread and the wine transfigure into mystically and magically into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. That Christ's work on the cross was in fact not finished, but perpetuates at every Mass in every Roman Catholic church across the world. But the Reformation, the Reformation brought the the light of the gospel to the dark ages. It, It made plain through the preaching of the word of God that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. The the reformers essentially pushed they pushed the altar to the side and they brought the pulpit to the center. 
That's why this pulpit is right here. The pulpit is the, is the focal point of when you walk in to worship, when you go into God's house. That's how it was, what the reformers taught, what they designed their churches to be like. They said that the Lord's Supper is an important institution, obviously. That by the Lord's Supper, we proclaim his death until he returns. But also, they said, as 1 Corinthians 1.21 says, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Or that verse literally says, it pleased God through the foolishness of preaching what we preach to save those who believe. It pleased God through the foolishness of preaching, proclamation proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. See, out of the darkness of the Middle Ages came the light of the proclaimed gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ, that all who call upon the the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. The same is actually true even in our own lives. We, We lived in darkness before Christ. But God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. And it's post tenebras lux, after darkness light. Well, this morning we're kind of finishing up this um, three-week Reformation checkup. I'm not sure what to call it, but... This is a, we've been looking at the life of the church and the life of her members. Last week I mentioned those particular characteristics that have historically made up a church from the Belgic Confession. These biblical prescriptions that we believe that the, that the Bible teaches must be maintained here if we are to be a Christian church. Namely, a, a proper understanding and, and proclamation of the gospel. A regular uh, observance of baptism and the Lord's Supper. The practice of of biblical church discipline as necessary, and that presumes a, a biblical church membership. Over the past few years, um, we've had the privilege of welcoming many new families into, into the membership of this body, Redemption Bible Church. Sometimes when people begin to attend a new church. They're ready to join the membership right away. Sometimes they're ready right away. Others take some time. And as elders, we respect that. There are a variety of reasons why someone would want to join quickly and a variety of reasons maybe to wait a little while. But one thing that we need to remember, this is just the beginning. Joining a church is just the beginning. So as we, as we look at what we think the future might have in store for us as God's people living in 2020, almost 2024, living in this dark time, as we consider what the future might have in store for us, we know, we understand that we are going to face some challenges as Christians as we look at the coming weeks, the coming months, the coming years, years to come. We're going to be challenged not to think about the things of God, not to think about spiritual things, to downplay the importance of the the assembly of the saints, the gathering together of the believers. But we can't. We can't downplay any of this. And I think we can see from today's passage why the assembly is so vitally important to the health of the saints. This idea is not unique to me. You've, you've probably heard me say it before. Church membership is a declaration that we are citizens of the kingdom of God. And we know that, that life inside the kingdom must be distinct from, from any other type of living. We learned this from our study of, of Leviticus, right? The people of God were to be distinct from the people around them. Leviticus gave us types and shadows of the kingdom that was inaugurated when Christ came. And as citizens of his kingdom, we're given certain instructions as to what what everyday kingdom life is to look like, especially as we see the day of the Lord drawing near, right? 
So look at verses 19 to 25 again here. We're going to spend our time in these verses. The book of Hebrews, so Hebrews 10, verses 19 to 25, but the book of Hebrews itself is unique in, in several ways from other, um, even from other New Testament epistles. Uh, no one is certain who wrote it, although there are lots of theories. The author never explicitly even tells us who it's written to, um, although the subject matter, as you read through the book, makes it pretty clear that it is written to Christians of Hebrew or Jewish descent. In fact, we call it the letter to the Hebrews, but that's just tradition. What is certain, however, is that one of the themes of this book that you can see all through Hebrews is the supremacy of Christ. The writer, the the author of Hebrews, he compares Jesus Christ with all of the features of the Old Covenant in order to show them that Jesus is the answer and that they don't need to turn back to the old ways, the old paths. That, That all of the old Jewish customs and symbols and ceremonies are actually fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so the the author here shows us how Jesus is a better Moses. Jesus is is better than the angels. Jesus is better than the prophets. Jesus is better than Joshua. Jesus is better than, than David. He's better than all of the priests and prophets and all of the Old Testament symbols. He offered a better sacrifice than the previous sacrifices. He's a better priest than their priests. And he offers a better covenant than the old covenant. And all the way through chapter 10, verse 18, is a presentation of the the supremacy of Jesus Christ. And so the writer of this book, it's, it's really a sermon, the preacher here, has presented Christ's supremacy really from all sorts of different angles He's left no stone unturned in an effort to get his listeners or his readers to keep hanging on to Jesus Christ. Don't let go, he's saying over and over and over again. Why? Because Jesus is the reality toward which everything in the Old Testament is pointing. In Jesus can be found the fulfillment of all that had been promised. Paul tells us this explicitly in in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20. He says, for all the promises of God find their yes in Him. That's why it is through Him that we utter our amen to God for His glory. So then what what are the implications then for the life in the kingdom? What do these things mean for us as, as members of Redemption Bible Church? as citizens of the kingdom of God. For those of us who have established this church or reestablished it over the last decade or so as an outpost, an embassy of the kingdom of God here on the western edge of the metropolis of Bell Fountain, Ohio. Well, there are three things that the writer of Hebrews tells us that we must do as a response to everything that Jesus did. And everything that Jesus, in fact, is, we are to draw near, hold fast, and stir up. These things are a a common drum that I beat in the church. We are to draw near, to hold fast, and to stir up. Before we get into that, we need to look at the opening verse of this paragraph. Because the the first couple of verses here, they they really summarize some of the central truths that this preacher has been been teaching about Christ's priesthood and what he has accomplished for his people in that role as their chief priest. The first thing that we need to notice is that the preacher says in verse 19, therefore brothers, or therefore brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ. See, he's, he's writing to fellow Christians people that he believes, that the author here believes, are his brothers and sisters in Christ. This is important, because as we walk through the passage, um, we need to keep this in mind, because getting saved, 
Getting saved is not the point of the Christian life. Do you understand that? It's not the end all of the Christian life, getting saved. In fact, a, a simple summary of the Christian life is that the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. We've had, um, over the past couple of years, we've had a whole bunch of baptisms. And for them, we praise God. Many of them have been the kids that have grown up in your families and in this church. We also know that, that with baptism, discipleship is really just beginning, right? So for instance, it's, it's every p- Christian parent's goal for all of us as parents, it's our, it's our goal that our, that our children would trust in Christ, but we know that it doesn't end there. That getting saved isn't the, the point of the Christian life, it's just the beginning. Now, from that point on, we are taught how to glorify God, how to enjoy Him forever, how to be like Christ, how to be holy as He is holy. Look at the rest of verse 19 here. Therefore, brothers, therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. What he's just been writing about is that Jesus, as the chief priest, he has fully, perfectly, and permanently accomplished the atonement for the sins of of God's people. Think of Leviticus chapter 16, the day of atonement. Do you know why that was necessary? Let's go back to the beginning. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, God instructed Adam like this. He said, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And we all know what happened next. They ate. And they died. And yet they did not die physically on the day that they ate it. Because God, in His mercy, provided a substitute. And in chapter 3 of Genesis, we read that the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed, clothed them. God provided protection for them. He provided a covering for them. Something died that they might live. But God never changes and His promises always come to pass. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 20 says, the soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Or as Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. But, but now the penalty had been paid. See, up until that time in Genesis 2 and 3, under the Old Covenant, and really throughout the Old Testament, the work of the priests was only temporary. It only represented symbolically what Jesus would do in the future. It was incomplete. All of the animal sacrifices, including that one in chapter 3 that God did himself, all of the sacrifices didn't really cover their sins. They just pointed forward to the, to the true Lamb of God who would pay the full penalty, as John the Baptist would proclaim, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's what he says here up in verses 10 to 14. J- just listen to those verses again. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. For every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, namely himself, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified, those who have trusted in him, those who are his. As a result of Jesus' work, 
because of his shed blood, his perfect, spotless sacrifice, the barrier, the, the curtain between God and his people has now been torn down. If you remember, as we worked through Leviticus, in the temple, um, entering the Holy of Holies, or the most holy place, entrance into that was absolutely forbidden by any ordinary people. Okay? In fact, only Levites could even get close to it, priests only, and only the chief priest could actually go in, and then only once a year on the Day of Atonement. The only way into the presence of God was through that curtain. But only the chief priest is allowed in there. But now, now the only way into God's presence is through Jesus Christ. He tore that curtain down and he opened up the way to God. Then, under the, under the old covenant, God's people could only go so far. They could not enter into God's presence. But now, now because of what Jesus has done, God's people, the citizens of the kingdom, have the right to walk straight past the curtain and into the throne room of God. Matthew and Mark both tell us that at the moment Jesus died, that curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. It's as, if, it's as if Jesus Christ, our great high priest, the chief priest, walked up to the, to the Holy of Holies, stopped at the curtain, that, that barrier wall that keeps God's people out. It's as if he walked up to that, reached up, and tore it open. And then he turns to the kingdom, the citizens of the kingdom, and he says, come. Come and approach the throne of grace. And then he steps through and he sits down at the right hand of the Father. No one, no one else could do that. Only Jesus Christ. Well, that's just a brief summary of all of the things that the author of Hebrews has been explaining over those first 10 chapters. But now here, beginning in verse 22, really, he begins to spell out how those truths are to be applied to the lives, to our lives as Christians. So specifically, as I said, he gives gives three clear responses to Christ tearing open that barrier between us and God. And the first thing that we are to do as a church is to draw near. Draw near. Look again at verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That verse to the Hebrew mind is a startling verse. That verse would give them palpitations if they understood God's law. Remember, this is written... To Jews. This is written to Israelites. This is written to those who had clung to the Old Testament as their heritage. And the defining moment of Israel's history was what? It was the Exodus. It was when God delivered them and and started sending them toward the promised land. It was when God's people had been delivered from their slavery in Egypt and, and they gathered at Mount Sinai. But listen to what happened when they were at that mountain. I've referred to this a whole bunch of times over the last year, I guess. But Exodus chapter 19, verses 10 to 12 says this. The Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And you shall set limits for the people all around, saying, Take care not to go up onto the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. They were not to draw near to God. He would come down close to them, but they were forbidden from actually seeing him. They couldn't even touch the mountain for fear of death. Why? These were... These were God's chosen people. And in that moment, any attempt to come near to God would have meant certain death. 
Because of their sins. Because of their sin. These were God's chosen people and they were sinners. God is holy and they were defiled by their own sin. They needed an atonement. Their sins had not been atoned for. They had not been reconciled to God. God's wrath against their sin had not been appeased. It was for their own good, in His great mercy, that they kept their distance, that they didn't draw near. This was how, this was how life and worship was for the people of God. This far and no further. Later on, when the tabernacle was built, it had similar prohibitions, right? When the temple was built under Solomon's reign, same thing. You can come this far, but that's it, or you will surely die. This was one of the continuing messages for God's people in the Old Testament. Keep away. Stand back. Maintain your distance. Do not draw near. And until one uh, would come who would forever and completely address their sin finally and fully, and the, and the consequences of their sin finally and fully, this continued to be the case. Do not draw near. But then Jesus came. And, and he completely uh, turned this upside down. It becomes the opposite. Come in. Let us draw near, the preacher says here. Because Jesus accomplished what no earthly priest could ever do. Notice the command is not to go out and do a, a bunch of things that will earn us entrance into God's presence. You cannot do anything to reconcile ourselves, right? Instead, we are commanded to draw near because of what Christ has fully accomplished. Because it was Christ who went up and tore that curtain because it was Christ who paid the penalty for our sins he was the Lamb of God who took away the sin and the shame there's nothing else that needs to be done in order for us to enter into God's presence not a mass not sacraments no works done by us allow us entrance into God's presence. Instead, he says, draw near with a true heart. Not just outward appearances. Sometimes people draw near to God in worship simply to be seen, right? Because if you don't, someone will wonder where you are. <laughs> you don't go to church, right? But that's not the way it's supposed to be. We're supposed to draw near to God, to approach God with true sincerity, with true hearts in full assurance of faith, because of Christ's work. It's, so I'll put it this way. If you're a believer, if you have trusted in Christ for salvation, there is no reason to doubt that God will grant access to his throne because we have been made clean. We have been made new. 1 Corinthians 6, 11 says, You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Do you hear that? Christians can draw near because of Christ's work. What does that mean? What does it mean to draw near to God? Does it mean go to church? Or does it mean something more than that? Well, this preacher here uses this phrase. In fact, he's used it a few times before, even in this book. Let's look back at a couple of those verses. Turn back to chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Hebrews 4.14 says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Draw near to the throne of grace. Of grace. 
We're told to boldly approach God in his very throne room. As if we were approaching an earthly king to ask for favor and for mercy. We draw near to the throne of grace with prayer and petition. When we pray as a body, when we pray as a church, when you pray individually, we pray through and because of Jesus. We draw near to God because of Jesus. We boldly approach the throne of grace. The, we usually call it the pastoral prayer. I prayed a bunch today, but that long prayer in the middle, that's us drawing near to the throne of grace. I happen to be the one talking, but it is us praying for this church, drawing near to the throne of grace. Now, turn over to chapter 7, verse 25. Just this one verse. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. This verse is saying that the very act of salvation is an act of drawing near to God. Becoming a Christian is the only way to draw near to God through Jesus Christ. Now look back at our passage today here in chapter 10. The other way that we draw near is not only, not only do we do it through prayer, chapter 4, not only do we do it by becoming a believer in chapter 7, but here in chapter 10, we draw near to God by assembling with other Christians who profess faith in Jesus Christ. The whole context of this, of this passage speaks of a, of a gathered community of believers, the assembly of the saints. Let us, let us, let us, over and over. This is a picture of the assembled people of God. Verse 25. Not neglect to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Not neglecting to meet together. In Matthew 18, verse 20, and even in the midst of instruction about what would become, uh, come to be called church discipline, Jesus says this. He gives this promise, Matthew 18, 20, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Now that verse is about authority, specifically the authority to discipline those who claim the name of Christ yet are willfully living in unrepentant sin. But, but, but the point is this, there is something unique about the gathering of God's people. There's something unique about the assembly of the saints. We are to gather together. We are to draw near together to the throne of grace. The second thing that we're to do as a church in response to Jesus' work as our great high priest is verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Hold fast. We are to hold fast. I know as well as anybody here that it is tempting to fall back to the ways of the world. It is tempting to fall back to the ways of the world. It is tempting to forsake the church. It's tempting to go to Florida and not return. For lots of reasons. <laughs> it's tempting to stay home on Sundays, work on projects. It's tempting to stay outside where it's beautiful. It's tempting to stay home and watch the game or to sleep in or to be alone. Those actions in and of themselves don't lead to unbelief. They don't cause us to stop believing in the hope for which we wait, the hope for which we gather every Sunday. But the drift is there. The drift of your heart away from the ultimate priority, which is worship. In fact, transformational worship, Romans 12 says. And when this happened... These other things become more important, right? Me time becomes more important. 
Whatever projects we each happen to be working on becomes more important than the gathering together, the assembly of the saints. Our hearts drift away from the confession of our hope toward those idols that we have made more and more important. But some say, you don't understand, those things are important. I know. They are important. But we need to hold fast to what is of ultimate importance and I think that when we cling to those other things whatever they are it shows us that it is possible it it is possible that you've never really embraced the hope that can only be found in Christ Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5 examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith test yourselves Or do you not know this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ lives in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? We must hold fast as a church. There are whole churches and denominations that have drifted and continue to drift away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're... Well, I'm standing. You're sitting in one that did previously drifted away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. We must hold fast as a church and we must each hold fast because he who promised is faithful. And that gives us to the third response to Jesus' work. So let us, let us draw near and let us hold fast to the, our confession and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Stir up. Look at the connection. Because Jesus, by his blood, has reconciled us to God, then we are to engage with each other and provoke one another toward, toward love and good deeds. Listen, a genuine, a genuine response of faith to the completed work of Christ is love for his church, love for his bride. And this love can be seen in our ministry to the church, our love for one another, our engagement with one another in the, within the church. This is a church that genuinely loves one another. I've seen it, I know it, I've experienced it. This is a church that genuinely loves one another. And we are to continue to provoke each other to imitating Christ, to stir up. That's what stir up means there. It means provoke. It's like stirs on the back of your boots. We are to spur one another on. We are to stir one another up. We are to poke one another with a stick until we act like Christ for the sake of the kingdom. How do we do this? How, 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 do, we, how do we draw near? How do we hold fast? How do we stir one another up? Again, verse 25. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We don't do this by neglecting to meet together. We don't do this by saying that Christianity, some would say, is a private religion. It's no one else's business. Christianity might be personal, but it's not private. The Christian life is supposed to be lived in community. It's supposed to be lived in a community of like-minded believers, which you're doing. How do we do this? By meeting together, by coming together, by making it a priority to be with God's people and to, to connect with this local body of believers. We do this by making the pulpit, the gathering together under God's word, a priority in our lives. E- even each week, as we, the covenant people of God, draw near with a, f- a true heart in full assurance of faith. We do this by making the, the table, or, or, or let's say the fellowship, the breaking of bread together. We do this by making this an opportunity to know and love one another so that we can fulfill that long list of one another's that we see throughout the New Testament. That we may consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, which will result in our taking the gospel out to the world, to the square, to the public, to our neighbors to our co-workers, to our friends, all the while holding fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. That, that without wavering part, that's going to be hard in the next couple of years. 
For some, it's been hard already. We hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. This is the point that the preacher of Hebrews is making here. He's emphasizing the absolute necessity of the citizens of the kingdom to gather together, to spend real time together, because without that, there's no way that we can encourage one another toward love and good deeds, inside or outside of the church. Without it, we will inevitably drift away from our confession of hope. Without that, without a confession of hope, we will inevitably, eventually, Stop drawing near to God. I was talking with a couple of guys at the door earlier this morning about all the churches around that are small and shrinking. Not all of them have drifted. But a lot of the people who used to fill them have. But we need to hold fast We need to stir one another up so that we may draw near together. And we're to do this and through the end until God takes each one of us home. And until then, until God takes us, we're to continue to draw near in worship and in prayer. We're to hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. We are to stir one another up, to provoke one another toward Christ-likeness. That, that phrase, post tenebras lux, after darkness light, 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 and 7 says this, This is the message that we have heard from Him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 to 16, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. We live in a dark world, but we are called to let the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ shine. And as the light shines in the darkness... The darkness shall not overcome it. The darkness shall not overcome it. We're the light of the world. We gotta shine, as the newsboys sang. It's it's in my head, I can't. (laughs) Let's pray. Father, I pray that we would be, that we would shine the light of the gospel. Not shine the light of personality of our church or how awesome our church is or anything like that, but that we would shine the light of the gospel into a a crooked and perverse generation. That we would shine the light of the gospel into the hearts of those who walk through the doors. Those that we have contact with at, at our jobs, our neighbors, our friends, our family who live around us and are, and are trapped in the darkness, wandering around, unable to see the truth. Father, that we would be the light of the world. That we would shine the light of Christ. That we as a church would always shine the light of Christ that it would be obvious in our love for one another, that it would be obvious in our worship, that it would be obvious in our care for the lost, our compassion for the souls of those who who are condemned already, that our light would shine, the light of Jesus Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.